Hello, you just walked into Game Scrap and a video all about the CDI. I'm Brad Hicks, aka Game Scrap's Dr. Swank, and I take way too long to make videos. I told you I'd come back, assholes! When you sit back and think of the handful of horrible gaming consoles that have graced us over the past 20 years, none could be considered more of a diaper rash than the CDI from the Philips. After all, what other console got opportunity handed to it on a silver platter more than this thing? I can't keep up my VCR. They had CD media, they got characters on loan from Nintendo, so how in the hell can you mess all that up? Well, they managed to find a way to make something that falls between the Virtual Boy and the N64 in utter uselessness. So without further ado, here's a brief rundown of the CDI, one of the most confusing consoles ever released. The choices we make in life affect the outcome, is that it? A very interesting observation. May I show you how to hook up a compact disc interactive machine to any television set? First announced way back in 1986 and finally released in 1991, the CDI started a seven-year uphill battle and countless identity issues to become one of the most loathed, yet intriguing, game consoles in recent years. Its history speaks more for the console than the games ever could. So let's start with a quick history lesson on how not to market a high-end interactive machine that may have never been intended for games in the first place. 1986, Philips creates the Compact Disc and announces the CDI, or Compact Disc Interactive, a machine that not only plays CDs, but actually lets you interact with them. In an effort to drum up support, development kits and prototypes are given to developers by 1988. That's a full three years before the machine is unleashed into the world. 1991, and you can feel the disappointment in the air as five years of waiting come to an end. The CDI is released and marketed as a high-end CD player, capable of not only music, but video discs, photo discs, discs that enable your drunk friends to sing karaoke, and of course the proprietary interactive CDI formatted discs. The first titles released for the CDI consisted of interactive encyclopedias, self-help applications like the laughably bad Joy of Sex, I like my body when it is with your body. It is so quite new a thing. Muscles better and nerves more. I like your body. I like what it does. I like its house. I like to feel the spine of your body and its bones and the trembling, firm smoothness and which I will again and again and again kiss. I like kissing this and that of you. I like slowly stroking the shocking fuzz of your electric fur. Well, I'm completely flaccid now, thank you. And low-rent, high-priced renditions of classic board games such as Connect 4 and Battleship. But seriously, at what cost? All the fancy FMV only made the games drag on for an eternity, and the graphics, which I should remind you are only 16-bit, really did nothing to replace the pegs and checkers of the real thing. So what else could this new CD media do to add to the experience? The computer won this game. Of course, this did nothing to improve these borid games, but what it did do was foreshadow the sort of multimedia gluttony that plagued that generation of hardware. You know, games that aren't worth wiping your ass tacked onto a cheesy cock rock soundtrack while the guy in the sound booth is getting off on using thousands of sound effects from their public domain attic. Of course, that Rescue initial $500 investment to get the hardware really didn't get you the full experience. Uh, no experience was complete without this. This Motel 6 Bible-sized uh, thing here is a digital video cartridge uh, sold separately by Philips. Uh, it allowed MPEG-1 decoding and 
I'll let you play uh, some of the more intense full motion video games and ironically enough some not so intense games that didn't even have full motion video for some reason. Around the same time the CDI was taking off, Philips was in cahoots with Nintendo on the now infamous SNES CD add-on. Say that ten times fast. By some sort of miracle, they got the rights to produce four games based on Nintendo characters without any adult supervision. These games would become notorious for shitting on the reputation of Nintendo's Golden Boys. The princess to invite us over for a picnic, eh, Luigi? I hope she made lots of spaghetti! Girls! Wake up, Impa! We're going to Gamelon! All right, dear. I'll get the Triforce of Wisdom. And asexual metrosexual elves, too, I suppose. Gee, it sure is boring around here. My boy, this piece is what all true warriors strive for. I just wonder what Ganon's up to. So out of fear of putting you to sleep, let's take a look at Nintendo through the eyes of autistic children. <laughs> First up is Hotel Mario, a sort of puzzle platform game that somehow shoehorns Bowser into the hotel service business where he has, once again, captured Princess Toadstool Peach and is holding her prisoner in one of his seven hotels. I'm willing to bet that the princess is in the last hotel that Mario actually looks in. Why doesn't he just start there and get it all over with? Mario has to close doors on multiple floors to keep the Goomba works from taking over. Jump, smash, close the door, collect a coin, move on to the next level. Donald Trump hair visor not included. Next we have everyone's favorite asexual Androno child Link and Link the Faces of Evil. Here Link is embroiled in a story that's far too complicated for me to sum up, so let's just get it straight from the source. Your Majesty, Ganon and his minions have seized the island of Korodai. Hmm, how can we help? It is written, only Link can defeat Ganon. Great, I'll grab my stuff! Taking a page from Bastard Child Sibling Zelda 2, the game is played from a side-scrolling 2D perspective where Link must fight and jump over things on one half of a painting, then jump and fight up the other half just to get anywhere. If he doesn't die first, that is. Sorry, Link. I can't give credit. Come back when you're a little, mm, richer. Knowing full well that Link Faces of Evil was a miserable experience, Animation Magic decided the fans needed more. So they threw a new coat of paint on Faces of Evil and came up with Zelda, Wand of Gamelon, which has you playing, oh, you guessed it, a palette-swapped Link as Princess Zelda in another side-scrolling kid's finger painting. Same awful animation, same awful game. This time, Link is captive and Zelda has to save him. It's role reversal at its most hilarious. Isn't it lovely? Bring some fairy dust and I'll make it a magic cloak. Last up, we have what's probably the most interesting and almost playable Zelda's adventure. When it makes up in classic Zelda gameplay, it counters with a laughably low costume budget, amazing voice acting, and creepy digitized presentation. I am so exhausted from my travels. If only I would known to cross the chasm rift with the ladder, it would have saved me months. The fact that Zelda's adventure wasn't even produced by Animation Magic was advantageous, but not nearly enough to redeem the damage that had already been done. This was the final turd hurled in the faces of Nintendo's top tier. Not that it mattered at all. After all, you'd have to actually sell CDIs to do any real damage to your reputation anyways. The majority of the games released for the CDI rarely ventured outside of point-and-click adventure games such as Voyeur. Mm. Yes, more. Or Dragon's Lair styled games of timing like Escape from Cyber City. Or live-action shooting galleries like Thunder in Paradise. Once in a while, though, a real game from a real genre will pop up. For instance, shooters like Steel Machine, or platformers like The Apprentice, which actually turned out to be one of the best games for the console. It's just too bad none of these games could ever be experienced the way they are intended thanks to the hardware limitations of Philips' big black monolith. Here's a great example of platforming, CDI style. Here's Christmas Country. Now, Christmas Country is a very straightforward, easy platforming game aimed at children 
with a Christmas theme. Not much to it except for the fact that it's about impossible to play with this controller. The basic mechanics go like this. You're supposed to move left to right with this D-pad, you sprint with the one button, you jump with the two button. Um, unfortunately, in practice, it turns into a game of twister between your two thumbs, the D-pad, and the uh, two buttons here. Um, at the same time, it's very convenient because you're already going to be in a prayer position hoping that this controller isn't going to cut out on you in the middle of a jump for the umpteenth time. Oh hey, it's 1994 all of a sudden and the CDI is selling worse than Guitar Hero by this point. So the geniuses at Philips decide to give the console a makeover and market it as a gaming machine. A newer, slimmed down and sleeker model with an actual honest to god gamepad is released and pandered as one of the first CD based gaming machines. Rumors that an all-night brainstorming session of listening to Ace of Bases I Saw the Sign leading to this decision are greatly over-exaggerated. To further drum up support, Phillips airs constant late-night infomercials featuring a guy named Phil who is held captive in front of a giant version of the TV wall from a clockwork orange. He's kept until Stockholm Syndrome ultimately sets in and is only released when he gives up his wallet for a CDI and his freedom. After all, who better to sell your $500 machine to than the drunk, unemployed, or tweaked out? Send down the next one. Certainly. While the rest of the world is awake, however, Phillips starts an almost creepy ad campaign featuring the late Phil Hartman, which is about the only good thing to come of this whole mess. Stay you're watching TV and this guy says... It's CDI, friends, the next generation CD player that works with your TV. And you say... But I have a CD player. And your mom says... No, dear, CDI works with your television. You probably feel pretty dumb and maybe even fake it like you'd already experienced the ultimate in games, movies, music, and more. Trust me, babe, I know about this CDI stuff. This newer model, the CDI 450, gets packaged with one of the CDI's most visually impressive games, Burn Cycle. There's actually been some debate over whether the CDI was ever intended to be a gaming machine in the first place or whether the software was ever intended to go beyond Battleship or game shows for that matter. Which actually makes sense considering that the CDI really sucked at pushing pixels and couldn't scroll a background to save its life. Which actually made things more impressive once you found a game that could actually pull it off. 1996 saw the release of the CDI's first FPS with Atlantis, The Last Resort. Another game that not only impressed those poor fools who own this $500 paperweight, but actually looked decent in action too. By the summer of 1996, after countless infomercials, marketing campaigns, and makeovers, Phillips announced that it was putting the CDI out to pasture. It's on the black strike! Of course, the demise came at the hands of actual real gaming consoles coming to market, namely the PlayStation and Saturn. I know there's an abandoned warehouse full of CDI players around here somewhere. Some CDI titles ended up getting ported to these consoles, but the rest were ultimately forgotten. And Phillips cried. Stroke limit. Well, there you have it. The confusing, sordid life of the CDI. The little console that tried and tried and tried and ultimately couldn't. So until next time, I am Brad Hicks, a.k.a. Game Scraps Dr. Swank. Please get the hell out of my house. Me name is Harry the Harrier, fool. I come from Zeltoid, with the aliens to rule. I've learned trickery from Henry VIII and more, and I lead the brain blobs with a vengeance in store. I've traveled in the time machine a zillion more years than you. And though you may have it now, what good can you do? We've captured the dinos and brought them into today. Unless you move quickly, there'll be little more to say.